Hi there, this is John from RevSoft, and in this presentation is an overview of how Rev Scheduler works with Enterprise One on all platforms. We worked on this with our North American Enterprise One partners at ERP One, and all the data and jobs that we will show are from their AWS cloud server instance. When we started the E1 integration, we came up with a list of things that we wanted to be able to do. So this is a list. The first task we needed to be able to do was to automate the execution of the UBE processes. The next task was to not expose any passwords used to submit the UBEs, as you can see in the run UBE command. The next task was we wanted to be able to retrieve some execution data from E1 and display it in Rev Scheduler job number, process ID, etc., etc. Then we got into the difficult stuff. The next task was to only submit the UBE when there's data to be processed, like in the GL post, only when there are approved batches waiting to be processed. The next task was, now that we had the UBE running, why not expose the execution data as variables so that the rev scheduler scripts could use it in the same job, like the job number, process ID, report, version, etc. The next task was that some UBEs generate PDFs, so why not run the UBE, then read the PDF immediately to get the results and check and see if there's any issues. So in the same job that you ran the UBE, you can check the PDF for any issue, report them immediately after the UBE has been executed, all in the one job. The last task was, okay, all good, now we can read the PDF. How about retrieving some of the data or strings from the PDF and be able to use it? So we could run the GL post, see if there's any issues, and if there is, retrieve the GL batch number and use that in emails, dashboards, help desk tickets, etc. Okay, so now let's check those seven tasks in a little more detail. The first thing we needed to do was to automate the execution of the UBE process. So for anyone that's new to Enterprise One, to execute a single run UBXML process, you need to run the run UBXML command three times, as we've shown here. So what we decided to do was to make that a little bit simpler and create the rev UBXML command that allows you to run the UBEs very simply in Rev Scheduler using a single command. This allows the UBEs to act as triggers for functions on the local or remote servers and also for the UBEs to be triggered by functions on local or remote servers as well. The second thing was the exposure of passwords used to submit the UBE process. Now, just a quick note here, in all RevSoft modules, variables always start with a hash or pound sign. I'll be referring to that as a hash sign today. So user variables are hash USR and the values are visible, whereas encrypted variables, hash ENC, are never visible and always displayed as bracket, encrypted, bracket. They will be never visible in Rev Scheduler tables, displays, logs, or job logs. Now, in the XML files, you'll find the password is visible. Eh, we can't fix that. That's an Oracle job. Now, if the Rev UB XML command is defined as user equals hash user variable and password equals hash ENC variable, when it executes, it will look like user equals exposed user variable and password equals bracket encrypted bracket. Again, the encrypted variable contents are never exposed. We've just completed the first stage of a global conversion from an on-premises IBM i-series with IBM AJS over to Rev Schedule on Linux in cloud. And part of the process was to convert the exposed password run UBEs in AJS over to encrypted variables in Rev Scheduler. The customer was speechless. We can't say who they are, but if you see the big white delivery trucks in a McDonald's store, that should be a good clue. Now, since it would take Oracle a long while to fix up the XML files with the exposed variables, we decided to add the delete argument in the RevUB XML command. And if it's set to Y, it will delete all the XML files for the current UBE process, primary, secondary, and output XML files, where you will find the password is exposed in the mall. Okay, so on to task three. What we wanted to be able to do is retrieve some execution data from Enterprise One and display it in Rev Scheduler. So this is what it looks like in Enterprise One where we've got the job environment process. And in Rev Scheduler, guess what? We have the job number, all the details. Big difference here, we actually not only trap the job ID, we subtract 
the submitted process ID and the execution process ID. You won't see that in Enterprise One, but we actually store it in Rev Scheduler. Okay, rolling on to task four. This is to only submit UBEs when there's data to be processed. We've seen sites that just run UBEs, and a lot of the time they were unnecessary as there was no data to be processed. So in Rev Scheduler, we have the RJ check fill command, and that will check any tables for the numbers of records where it meets the where clause. So basically, very much like entering an SQL statement interactively and using the results or using the count value. In this example, we're checking to see if there are any approved GL batches to be processed, which is check fill of table F0011, are there greater than zero records, and is it a GL batch, and is it approved, waiting to be processed. Okay, this is what it looks like in the ERP1 Cloud AWS instance. That's the actual command that's used on that server to run this task. Moving on, task number five. Now that we had the UBE running, why not expose the execution data as variables so that Rev Scheduler scripts could use them in the same job? Now, as I said before, all RevSoft modules support the use of variables and they can be identified by starting with a hash. The E1 variables start with hash OW. This form shows the variables in the multi-run GL post job that we've created. Now, if we wanted to run the GL post, then identify the PDF it just created, what we would do is we use the variables hash future use to and hash ow job in along with the prefix of the printer queue, which could be in a variable as well. And instead of future use to, you could have used ow report and ow version, but we've just done it that way. Now, if this was executed in the job above, it would look like this. So it would automatically get the report version job number translated and inserted. Okay, on to task six. Now some UBEs generate PDFs, so why not run the UBE, then read the PDF to get the results, check and see if there's any issues, etc. all in the same scheduled job. So this will run immediately after the UBE has been executed. If we're running the GL post, we could scan the PDF and look for the string, one or more batches had errors. Look at this PDF and we can see that the errors in the execution. If we run the UBE and then the next script we execute in the same scheduled job is to check the PDF, we're minimizing the time between error recognition and notification, which should cut down the resolution time. The definition of the command would look like this with the variables in there, the OW, hash OW variables. The execution of the command with the translated OW variables looks like this. And this command will return AC, abnormal completion, if that string is detected in that PDF for the GL post. Okay, last task, task seven. So now we can read the PDF. How about retrieving data or strings from the PDF and be able to use that? We can use that data in emails, dashboards, help desk tickets, whatever we'd like. Looking at the output, we can see a lot of information. Now, in this example, we would like to retrieve the GL batch number and place it into a user variable. So we can then use that in this job here for 1349. The definition would look like this. We have to define where in the PDF to start looking and we're looking for the batch ty slash number. And then we're going to take the second word from there and place it in the user variable, user last bad batch number. When it executes with the translated hash OW variables, it will then pick up that GL batch number, post it in there, and that will be available to use for dashboards, emails, help desk tickets, etc. Okay, that is the end of the theory part of the overview. If you would like to, please take some time and see the practical video showing all of this in action with multi-run GL post execution. And if you want any more details, there's an email address down there, product underscore info at revsoft.com. Thank you very much for your time.